Welcome to the Unitarian Church of Lincoln on this Sunday morning. My name is the Reverend Oscar Sinclair. Each week since the beginning of the coronavirus pandemic last year, our congregation has gathered together at least twice. On Thursday night, when we tend to our community and each other directly on Zoom, and in this service on Sunday morning, broadcast on YouTube. And Sunday morning, whether in person or on YouTube, is a chance to proclaim who we are and what we're about, throwing open the doors of the congregation and proclaiming the radical love and welcome that is at the heart of our faith. The Unitarian Church of Lincoln, we say, aspires to be a loving community, uniting reason with spiritual exploration to transform ourselves and the world. And right now, in what we hope, what we believe are the closing months of this pandemic, we know that transformation is necessary, that we cannot go back to the world as it was. Arundhati Roy wrote at the start of this pandemic that historically pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and imagine their world anew. This one is no different. It is a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. We can choose to walk through it, dragging all that we have, or we can walk through lightly, with little luggage, ready to imagine another world and to fight for it. What other world will we imagine? How will we bring it into being? Step lightly and with little luggage, beloveds, there is still much work to be done. When weary with the long day's care, an earthly change from pain to pain, and lost and ready for despair, thy kind voice calls me back again. O my true friend, I am not lone while thou canst speak with such a tone. So hopeless is the world without, the world within, I doubly prize, thy world where guile and hate and doubt and cold suspicion never rise, where thou and I and liberty have undisputed sovereignty. Reason indeed may oft complain for nature's sad reality, and tell the suffering heart how vain its cherished dreams must always be, and truth may rudely trample down the flowers of fancy newly blown. I trust not to thy phantom bliss, yet still in the evening's quiet hour, with never failing thankfulness, I welcome thee, benignant power, sure solacer of human cares, and sweeter hope when hope despairs.
Our story today is called Caterpillar Dream by Jeannie Willis and also by Tony Ross. It was dawn, a soft breeze blew, in the wild grass, two flowers danced. They didn't look the same, they didn't dance the same, but they danced for the same reason. They both had a secret, it was hidden in their leaves. The secret would soon be out. Eggs, mysterious eggs, not snails, not frogs. Caterpillars, two curly caterpillars, one stripy and one plain. We are sisters, they said. When we grow up, we will be butterflies. We will worship the sun. Day by day, they grew. By night, they dreamed of all the things they would do when they were butterflies. They would wake to the song of the blackbird and fly through skies of forget-me-not blue. They would sip from buttercups split from sunbeams and bathed in gold dust. The days grew long. The caterpillars grew longer. It won't be long now, they said. We will be butterflies, beautiful butterflies, sisters under the sun. The bees were leaving. The flowers turned to seed. When the sun sleeps, we will sleep, the caterpillars said. When we wake, our dreams will all come true. The bees left. The flowers fell. The sun went down, just as the caterpillars hoped. But nature had her own dreams, her own hopes, which were not the same as theirs. The sun came up. The first sister woke, but she was alone. She flew through skies of forget-me-not blue. She searched among the sunbeams, but her sister wasn't there. The sun set, a nightingale sang, lullaby butterfly. The butterfly slept. In her dream, she saw her sister. She had woken to the owl. She was worshiping the moon, soaring through space, skipping through moonbeams and bathing in stardust. Dawn came, where dark meets day they met. One was a moth and one was a butterfly. Different dreams, but just as beautiful. We cannot all be butterflies, it seems. The world needs moths, just like it needs the moon. That's what keeps it turning, turning, turning. Same lullaby, just a different tune. Sweet dreams. And that is the end of our story. Those whom heaven helps, we call the sons of heaven. They do not learn this by learning. They do not work it by working. They do not reason it by using reason. To let understanding stop at what cannot be understood is a high attainment. Those who cannot do it will be destroyed on the lathe of heaven. Confucius and you are both dreams, and I who say you are dreams am a dream myself. This is a paradox. Tomorrow a wise man may explain it, that tomorrow will not be for 10,000 generations. Chuangzi, Chinese philosopher who lived around the 4th century BC. My wish for all of us this week is that we all find joy in the little things, a beautiful sunset, the giggle of a child, a perfectly ripe apple, the way the light reflects off of the snow or the kindness of a stranger. It is these little things that make up happiness. Joy comes in sips, not gulps. Sharing sorrows can be more difficult. The places that hurt us may be intensely personal. Sometimes we cannot yet speak of these things that are too personal or too raw. And yet love calls us on, on toward the healing that comes from knowing that we are held in the embrace of a universal love and in the embrace of people here who cannot always heal what is hurting, but who will walk beside each of us as we move through the sorrow any one of us may carry right now. As you listen to this next song, you may type your name or the name of those you wish to hold in joy or in sorrow.
into the chat box. Thank you for your presence. Hello. Due to the pandemic, we have to do church virtually. I cannot see you, so I have to use my imagination to create an image in my head of people, some I know well and some not so well, connecting as best as we can with TVs and tablets, laptops and desktops, iPhones and Androids. My name is Bert Smith. I'm a member of the Worship Associates of this church. Our settled minister, Oscar Sinclair, has the day off. But you are stuck with me. To begin my little talk, I would like to ask you to do a little imagination exercise. I would like you to imagine a young adult traveling through Kansas maybe 30 years ago on his way to somewhere else. He stops in a small town. He has an aunt who lives there and who is a tour guide on the weekends at an old historic mansion. The aunt lives in the back of the mansion in a small apartment, a nice perk for a retired person on a fixed income. The young man parks in front of the mansion, walks past the hedges, and opens the gate and walks onto the wraparound porch. He knocks on the door, but there is no answer. As he stands there, he thinks about his aunt, a painfully shy woman, a shyness magnified by a facial deformity that was caused by the forceps used by the doctor to extract her from the mother's womb. He knocks again, no answer. Time to go, he thinks. He's on his way to somewhere else. Just then, he sees his aunt walking down the street with a bag of groceries. Can I help you, sir? She says. We have tours on the weekends. The young man is puzzled. I'm Bert, your nephew, he says. His aunt begins laughing at her failure to recognize him. She almost drops her groceries. The nephew helps her with her groceries, and they go inside and have a nice visit. Then the young man says goodbye, gets in his chevette, and heads down the road to somewhere else. The aunt in this story laughed at herself for not recognizing someone she knew when she saw them in a place and time she didn't expect to see them. She shouldn't have laughed at herself. It happens to everyone. And I could tell you many more stories to illustrate this point, if you would care to hear them. 
The theme this month is imagination. But what does recognizing people or things when we aren't expecting them have to do with imagination? You can stand and talk, watch this little talk to the end and not hit the fast forward button. Maybe that will become clearer. Until then, you'll have to rely on your imagination to link the two. The word imagination probably means many things to many people. Words can mean anything that anyone wants them to, something illustrated by George Orwell in his novel 1984 with the concept of doublespeak. But a definition of imagination that I imagine many people would accept is the taking of all the ideas and memories and perceptions we have floating in our heads in restructuring and realigning them in new and original ways. When a child has an imaginary friend or puts on a play for an audience that isn't there, we all would accept that as imagination. But perhaps we can expand our definition a little more. We don't usually speak in the same breath of imagination in the dreams we have when we are asleep. Our daydreams and night dreams have some things in common, but we often often overlook our night dreams when we are talking about imagination, perhaps, perhaps because we have no control over them. They are wild things not subject to our will. A description we might use comparing the two would be to say that daydreams are like a child playing chopsticks and night dreams are like Vladimir Horowitz playing Liszt's B minor piano sonata. I've often wondered about night dreams and their purpose, but the articles and TV shows on the subject that I've seen never gave me an answer that satisfied me. The best book I have read about dreams was written by the science fiction author Ursula Le Guin. Ursula Le Guin, such a fascinating name. I had heard her name before, and my interest was piqued when our interim minister, Gretchen Woods, used quotations by Le Guin in a few of her sermons. I decided to read a book by Le Guin, but was unsure if I would like her writing style, so I went to the library and checked out the shortest book by her I could find. It was titled The Lathe of Heaven and was only 192 pages long. The Lathe of Heaven starts out with some very poetic prose, but quickly veers into what I thought was a goofy plot, plot which kind of reminded me of a comedic Twilight Zone episode. The main character, George Orr, has the bizarre ability or disability that whatever he dreams at night becomes reality the next morning. Not just his reality, but everyone else's as well. This is very disturbing to him, and he starts seeing a psychiatrist. The psychiatrist turns out to be a bad guy, and the plot gets more involved and goofier and goofier. But I don't think you tuned in this morning to hear a book report. The point about telling you about this book is to set up a question. We are not like the character George or in The Lathe of Heaven. Our dreams cannot, by themselves, change the world. But if we abandon our dreams, if we gave way to cynicism and apathy, what, if any, are the consequences? From A Vindication of the Rights of Woman by Mary Wollenstone Craft. We hope not to be misunderstood when we say that religion will not have this condensing energy unless it be founded on reason. If it be merely the refuge of weakness or of wild fanaticism and not a governing principle of conduct drawn from self-knowledge and a rational opinion respecting the attributes of God, what can it be expected to produce? The religion which consists in warming the affections and exalting the imagination is only the poetical part and may afford the individual pleasure without rendering it a more moral being. It may be a substitute for worldly pursuits and narrows instead of enlarging the heart. 
but virtue must be beloved as in itself sublime and excellent and not for the advantages it procures or the evils it averts, if any great degree of excellence be expected. People will not become moral when they only build airy castles in a future world to compensate for the disappointments which they meet with in this. Hello again. In part two of my book report, I would like to talk about a different writer, one who lived a couple centuries ago in England. She didn't write science fiction, as did the late Ursula Le Guin, because the science fiction genre had not yet been invented. However, Mary Wollstonecraft was someone who had great powers of imagination and use them to try to better the world. Mary Wollstonecraft's most famous book is A Vindication of the Rights of Woman, written in 1792. Her writing style is very pithy and witty. One of her more famous quotes involves the comparison of the perks granted women in patrimonial societies, such as the one she lived in, to those of a bird in a gilded cage. Mary Wollstonecraft had the audacity in 1792 to imagine a future society where women had an education equal to that of men, where women could own property and not just be treated as property. She even had the far-fetched radical notion that one day 
women should be allowed to vote. Mary Wollstonecraft was an active member of the church on Newington Green, one of the oldest Unitarian churches in England, a church which happened to be visited by Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, and John Adams on their diplomatic visits to England, as well as many other notable people of the day. Mary Wollstonecraft was a prolific writer considering that she died at the age of 38 due to complications from childbirth. Though the death of Mary was a horror to her husband and family, the child she gave birth to, baby girl, survived. This motherless child grew up to be an author even more famous than the mother she never knew. The baby was another Mary, whom we know as Mary Shelley. Mary Shelley's most famous book is, of course, Frankenstein, subtitled The Modern Prometheus. With the novel Frankenstein, Mary Shelley's imagination not only created one of the most enduring horror stories of all time, but she also created a whole new genre. Frankenstein is credited by most scholars as being the first science fiction novel ever written. The novel Frankenstein is far different than the garbled, cheesy Hollywood interpretations. For one thing, the name Frankenstein refers only to the doctor, the mad scientist of the plot, and never to the creature, the monster he creates. This is important when considering Shelley's mocking subtitle, The Modern Prometheus. Shelley's point being that the growth of science and technology without a parallel growth in ethics and personal conscience, engenders a world ripe for the creation of monstrosities. We can see Shelley's rockster running amok in the 21st century in the mind-boggling arsenals of weaponry cached by the superpowers and not-so-superpowers, by the unchecked burning of fossil fuels to the extent that it has begun to change our planet's climate, and the beginning of a mass extinction of wildlife, a diversity we should be shepherding, but are instead pushing out of the ecosystem. We should remember that the monster running amok is not the villain that Mary Shelley proposes. The villain in Mary Shelley's Frankenstein is not the creature despite his heinous crimes. The villain is Victor Frankenstein, the man who created the monster. And so too can we feel our own guilt when we and other people of conscience acquiesce the moral high ground to people of mere confidence, no matter how strong that confidence may be. Apathy creates monsters, and the victory of caging one or booting one out of office is a shallow victory indeed. That's enough of a dark theme, or perhaps too much for a Sunday morning. But before we leave Mary Shelley and the creature of her, her imagination behind us, let us consider one last aspect of the novel. The monster, as unloved and reviled as it was, took great solace in the sights and sounds of nature, in particular the sights and sounds of birds. Many people, including myself, enjoy watching birds. At our house, we have a bird feeder and my wife keeps it well stocked in the winter months. We enjoy seeing the juncos and sparrows and occasional chickadee flitting about the feeder and in the bushes. But one bird you don't see in the winter months is the bluebird. They don't tend to hang out around bird feeders anyway. I'd never seen very many bluebirds until my son built a bluebird house in Cub Scouts a few years ago. For those of you who aren't bird watchers, a bluebird is a small sparrow-sized bird with a dull blue back and an orange breast. If you just glance at it or see it from the corner of your eye, you might not recognize it or mistake it for a sparrow. I helped my son with the bluebird box a dozen or so yards from our kitchen window. That spring, we noticed a bird sitting on the box. 
We got out the binoculars, and sure enough, it was a bluebird. Today, many years later, we are quite accustomed to seeing bluebirds at our kitchen window, hopping around on the picnic tables or in the trees. It's funny, we did not command the bluebirds to come there. We did not wave a magic wand to make them appear. Bluebirds are wild creatures that do not bend to the will of man. But we did create a box, a framework of correct dimensions and materials that made the bluebirds feel welcome. Perhaps that is how it is with our imagination. We cannot create a better world by imagining it. But by imagining it, we can create a space where it might reside if it so chooses. And by imagining it, we might recognize it when it comes and not let it go by unnoticed. I had an aunt, a different aunt, who was always going around telling people to pray. Some people are big on praying. I confess that I'm not one of them. But I wonder if maybe the working part of that practice is the imagining of a reality that is different from the reality that now exists. A reality without war, greed, or hunger. A sisterhood and brotherhood of humanity. Is that a vision beyond what is possible? Or the only possibility worth imagining? Each week, whether in person or online, we pass the offering plate to support the work of this church. If you would like to give an offering, you may do so now online or through text giving. Simply text UC Lincoln space and the amount to 73256. These instructions are also in the chat box to the right of this video. You do not have to be good. You do not have to walk on your knees for a hundred miles through the desert repenting. You only have to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves. Tell me about despair, yours, and I will tell you mine. Meanwhile, the world goes on. Meanwhile, the sun and the clear pebbles of the rain are moving across the landscapes, over the prairies and the deep trees, the mountains and the rivers. Meanwhile, wild geese high in the clean blue air are heading home again. Whoever you are, no matter how lonely, the world offers itself to your imagination, calls to you like the wild geese, harsh and exciting over and over announcing your place in the family of things. Go in peace.